Welcome to Core Concepts. My name is James Renford Powell. I'm your host, and today we're going to have a little bit of a music introduction by Chris Cuminati, and then we're going to have our speaker who has been with us before, Joshua. We recently did a, a uh, interview on the Bookman Show with Joshua, and he's been on this show before, but we've uh, okay. prevailed upon him to come back again as he's leaving for the West Coast and then on to uh, New Zealand very soon. So we want to welcome those folks. Before we get started, I want to remind you that uh, you can see the Bookman shows, um, the core concepts lectures, the laws of material wealth, the audio books, and the Renford Theater all on YouTube. Just go to <coughs> youtube.com, type in Renford Broadcast Network. Also, that's linked to Radio by Renford, where we have radio shows, talk shows, virtually every day of the week. So go in and pick up those schedules and book, and also visit us, our virtual campus, the Institute of Applied Metaphysics, at www.iam.com. IAM-COR.org. Now, for our our introductory music, Chris Cuminati. Thanks, Jim. Hi. I'm supposed to introduce myself, and I will do so. But before I do so, I just want to thank you all. This is our last... Um, Today in Memphis, concerning the show, um, weekly session that we hold here in the coffee shop. And I, I've been really great with all, all your friendship and your welcoming spirits and Sharon and Jim and Ahmad and now Chris and yourselves and Julie. Thank you very much. And uh, my name is Joshua. That's not who I am, but I think that will suffice for today. You can call me Joshua. And uh, of course, um, last programs, as um, Jim invited me to talk here, to touch on the brain of Melchizedek and uh, what constitutes the difference between a person who is in tune with the higher field of values, spiritual field of values, and brain processes, his consciousness is shifted to perceive reality in a different manner, in a manner which is peaceful, where the person is uh, creative, is compassionate, it's, uh, it could fit the category of a, a righteous soul or a, or, or a saint or a, a, a tzaddik, calling it tzaddik, it's righteous, or a prophet or a simply a spiritual wise person. Um, now, this is an individual transformation, as we were touching on the last um, on the last talk. In the, that individual transformation can be very different for different people, though it's got also its fundamental similarities. But um, after having touched on the individual transformation and the scientific side of that and the challenge that it presents to actually. Um, have a complementarity between subjective experience and objective scientific research into one body of wisdom, one body of consciousness, properly articulated. Uh, I would like to touch today more on the social aspect of a transformation as such. Uh, not so much today I'm focusing on the individual aspect, which is a fundamental uh, aspect of this transformation. Every person needs to experience that for themselves. But what kind of community or society we, we would be living in, and uh, in a society where people were actually peaceful and kind and loving most of the time, uh, in a society where relationships were more family-like instead of a commercial or, or per, a, a legal person to natural person or things like that. Um, and so the question is, for me, um, if I go well back in the past, and let's say that I invoke the story of Abraham and Melchizedek. Well, according to the stories of the Old Testament, Melchizedek is a person that shows up to Abraham. And he introduces himself as a priest of the Most High God, El Elyon, in 
Hebrew, the Most High. And Abraham recognizes in Melchizedek, who, by the way, in Hebrew means Melchizedek means King of Peace, recognizes a very godly and peaceful presence to the point that Abraham supports him. It gives him tithes. It gives him part of his uh, uh, richness, his his capital, his possessions to support the livelihood and perhaps the work of Melchizedek. Now, we are um, told in this story that Melchizedek broke bread, bread and wine with Abraham. So bread and wine is more ancient than the times of Jesus and more ancient than the times of Moses. It goes back to at least the times of Melchizedek. Now, this symbolism of bread and wine, it's not a Christian symbolism. It's not a Jewish symbolism. It's a symbolism which it's accounted in, in the Bible at the times of Abraham. And Abraham being the father of uh, Ishmael and Isaac, well, he is the father then of many nations because of these people who became known new nations. And uh, if we trace the, 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 through the line of Isaac and Jacob, the trajectory of the lost tribes of Israel, which is of the 12 tribes of Israel, 10 of them, which were captured by Assyria and were lost socially to the world, uh, we can trace them up to when Assyria captured them. After that, they have disappeared socially to the world. However, the Jewish people, the remnant Jewish people, who are part of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and some of the Levites, they were captured by Babylon, and those people didn't disappear. And we know them today after the traditional Judaism that emerges in Babylon to keep these people alive in their own um, worship of the Most High God, a people who, who today it's not more than maybe 30 millions or something like that. But if we go to South America and we check out on the list of Sephardic Jewish names, most of South America, if not 80 percent, 60 percent of those family names are of Jewish origin where the Inquisition converted these people into Catholics. So they are of the Jewish bloodlines. Most of South America, Spain and Portugal mixed up with also African and some of the native people of those lands. So when we think about the prophecies of peace, just to start from that side, uh, and we take into the accounts of those possibilities, the accounts of the Torah, the, the book of the prophets, the stories of Israel, and the book of, uh, or the records of the testimony of Yeshua, which was the Messiah of Israel of those days, um, then we see that the prophecies speak about the reunion of 12 tribes, both in the Old Testament, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, most of these prophets talk about the days of the reunion of the 12 tribes and the manifestation of a community which is peaceful, it's godly, and it's not the same community as it was thousands of years before in the times of the desert. The prophet Jeremiah said that the Lord will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Jehuda, and that covenant would be different than the old covenant, which was the one that he made with Moses in the mountains. But that covenant was broken according to the words of the prophet Jeremiah. The new covenant is God putting his law and his spirit in the hearts and minds of people and says the Lord in that part, nobody will teach anybody about him because everybody will know him. He will be directly the teacher of all these people. Now, what kind of prophecy could be that if we have to account for that as truth when we today have a remnant of the Jewish people living on the land of Israel? This is the only, the only account, the Bible or the document of the Torah, that gives any hoots by any right to the people of Israel to live in that land. According to the Bible, that was divided in 12 tribes. But if this is a real token, a lawful token, you know, a title that allows the people of Israel to live in that land, then the Jewish people are not the only people who are supposed to live there because they were 12 tribes. 
And according to the prophecies, these 12 tribes are being reunited and every parcel of Israel is, is segmented in the Bible, a portion to each tribe. So what will happen in a situation like this where the people of Israel show up and only the Jewish people are living in that land with the modern state of Israel, which is not uh, what the Torah speaks about, and say, well, this land belongs to the tribes of Israel and God made us holy or peaceful and this is meant to be a place of peace where the light will shine to all nations. Well, I, I think I can tell in your minds that story wouldn't be really easy to digest in modern terms. Yeah? But this is the real integrity of that story. There is no other one. If you search, search the scriptures and you have to take the records for, for real, and for real, I mean in modern terms, that's the only record that gives the right to the people of Israel to exist there. And you have to then acknowledge that the whole record is for real and that the prophecies are for real. And that when you go to the book of Revelation, the second coming of Yeshua, it's not with churches, it's with, with, with 12,000 of each tribe of Israel. He's the gathering of the 12 tribes. And if you go to the Quran and, and the people of Islam, they are waiting for Isa to come and settle this issue once and for all, together with Mahdi. Now, if we have to put all these things together in the modern world to bring peace to the earth, if we have to settle in dialogues and conversations for our ancient heritage in a peaceful manner, well, I think we better start to talk to God to guide us through this process. <laughs> because what we know today, it's extremely fragmented and confusing. For example, the Christianity that we know today, it's the offspring of the Roman Empire. It's not a religion made by Jesus. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. So, why Christianity, why the Roman Empire you know, created Christianity? Well, we would have to ask Constantine, who was the one who came up with his vision, saying that God given him you know, the cross as a symbol and the sword to go and conquer the world and Christianize. But this was never the talk of Yeshua. On the contrary, Yeshua, Jesus said, whoever lives by the sword will die by the sword. Step out of that reality of uh, war because that's not where you should be if you want to be holy, if you want to be peaceful, if you want to be a blessing to the people around you. Jeremiah spoke the same. He speaks about holy people who are peaceful. And so if we see the surface of society today, behavioral wise, we see a lot of cultures with a lot of beliefs and on top of that, we have imposed nation states after the tearing down of kingdoms the last 300 years. And in place of kingdoms, humanity has put republics in many places. Then that is a very confused process. Now, peace at an individual level can be a much easier thing to sort out. I can go about finding God, establishing a relationship, and find peace. And if those prophecies of Jeremiah are for real, which I am convinced they are, uh, they might not look like the way we expect them to look, but let's say those prophecies are for real, then God should be at the moment waking up, up people all over the world, regardless of their religious beliefs, of their nationality, of their connection to any kind of a, um, art form or any kind of dietary ways of behaving, God should be waking up the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. And those genes by now are spread out all over the world. So if we have to think in modern terms of those two houses, we will have to somehow start to study the neurogenetic transmigration process of all these genes who carry the seed of peace since the days of Melchizedek. Well, that seed of peace is scattered all over the world. 
And by all means, it, it doesn't belong to one religion or one nation. So that means that if you imagine a pot of popcorns popping up, yeah, they should be popping up, you know, inside the pot somewhere. Okay? By the hand of God, by the grace of God. And by all means, not necessarily through the only doorway of Yeshua, Jesus. That's not what the prophet spoke. That's not what Jesus spoke. Jesus said, when he was asked, well, who are these guys who follow you? He said, well, they know me because the Father showed them who I am. As the prophet of old spoke. So they went directly through the, through the Father to recognize the Messiah. It wasn't the other way around. They didn't go through Jesus to meet the Father. And I don't think if anybody would ring the Father by phone, if you could do that. Hey, Dad, I just want to chat with you. We'll hang up on you and say, sorry, if you need to have a talk to me, please call my son. <laughs> Until he recommends you, don't call me back again, please. It doesn't make sense to me. Okay? And if you uh, call the son or any of the sons of, or daughters of God, I don't think they will tell you, well, you, you'll have to pass the test with me before you can get to the Father. I mean, that wasn't the word of Jesus. He said, you know, you send them to me, they're yours. And that was the word of a Jewish rabbi. Now, how is supposed a Jewish rabbi to come into this world, not anymore as a Jewish rabbi, however they looked of the types of Jesus, probably they didn't look black and white orthodox or reformed or anything like we, we know today, but how are they supposed to come, a group of people who are ignited in the light, scattered all over the world as a nation for God, as a family, how are they supposed to do that? If you try to renounce your nationality, in the United States you came, by the way, the only nation in the world which will allow you to renounce your nationality as long as you're overseas. Most of the nation states that I've made uh, a research on, they will not allow their citizens to renounce their nationality. So that's an imposition, it's not a choice. And by the way, it's a fraudulent contract because it's a contract that your parents acquired for you. It didn't have full disclosure. You didn't know anything about you know, the deal they were making for you by getting a certificate of a nation for you to be identified to a nation to be called the enemy of somebody else. <laughs> so if you wanted to renounce your nationality and become a person with identity in God's spirit and God's government, how would you do that? You would have to negotiate, yeah, if we're talking in terms of the 21st century, you're passing from one port to another by word of mouth or by some form of constitutional sovereignty done by you as king of your own kingdom. And then say to the people, well, I come in the name of God. You, Queen of England, you, you know, you say you were given power by God to be the reign, uh, queen of the commonwealth. Good, that's fine. So you and I should have an understanding. You work for God, I work for God. If I don't reach the peace and I'm here for good, I should have a, 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 you know, a pass through your land or through the lands you claim as your sovereign territory as a peacemaker. That would be the only way to negotiate with everyone who has got some form of sovereignty an embassy of peace. Well, there are hundreds of embassies in the world of hundreds of countries in different countries. I don't think one embassy more will harm any country and particularly if it's an embassy of peace. And that the subject of today. Now I can start my talk. <laughs> okay. So, the question here is how are we in modern days to articulate the dream of the Israelites, the dream of the Ishmaelites, the dream of the Hindus, the dream of the Buddhists, a word for peace. And how are we going to articulate that in a way that makes sense according to what constitutes a person who's peaceful and holy, both biologically and spiritually, or shall I say better, both spiritually and biologically, yeah? How are we going to do that? I cannot give you, grant you, the status of ambassador of peace. 
this is not something I could grant you to start with. No people in the world could do that. The United Nations shouldn't do that by all means. Though sometimes I suppose they do. They grant some kind of certificate of ambassador of peace. It's a, it's a title, but it's not the real status of an embassy of peace. To be the government of God in action, you need to be connected to that, which is God's law and God's spirit. You need to be the light in the world. It's the only way you can claim to be the king of righteousness or the queen of righteousness. If Melchizedek was the king of righteousness, that's what his name means, and king of Salem, because king of Salem is king of peace, well then, you're called to be an ambassador of that kingdom too. And I hope and I pray that you will never entertain the idea to institutionalize that kingdom because we will be repeating the same story. That kingdom is right here, right now. Here. Jesus said it's at hand. Well, look at it. It's right at hand. It's so near. It's so near because it's directly ignited in your soul by the agency of the Most High God, El Elyon. He will appoint you as an ambassador of peace. And when you can say, I am a sovereign being unto God, it means what comes out of your mouth, it's law. That's what a sovereign means, a person who decrees law. In the past, the kings were the sovereigns. Yeah, and the queens. Well, they still are. In New Zealand, the kingdom of New Zealand, the sovereign is Queen Elizabeth. At least to most people. She is the head of state. And she is the head of state of the kingdom of Canada, the kingdom of Australia, and the kingdom of England. And there are different kingdoms. It's just the same queen, the same person. She is the queen of the Commonwealth nations. Who is the king of South America? You may say, well, nobody's king in South America. I mean, we have so many democracies in South America. And I'll say, well, apparently so. But if you go to the constitutions and the preambles of the constitutions, you read, you will find that those are countries, republics, which are invoking the protection of God in the same manner the United States did when the founding fathers drafted the Declaration of Independence and matters though. And so, who are these people? Who are the sovereign people? They're gone. Today we don't have sovereign people, we have citizens. And there is a distinction between both. And I don't gotta go there, because that, that's not my, my subject today, but there is a distinction, okay? So in South America, every country that I read their constitution, for sure Venezuela invokes the protection of God and declares themselves to be a Catholic nation. If you're a Catholic nation, you are under the kingdom of the Pope. Because if you're a Catholic person and you've been baptized and you acknowledge that the Pope is the head of the Catholic Church, then that's your government. It's got its own council, it's got its own doctrine and its own laws. So unless you renounce to Catholicism with a letter of apostasy, you still are under the king of Rome. Well, not Rome as we know it in modern days, but the Roman church, church, which is the intermediary between the republics of South America and God. I don't think that was the case in the United States. The United States is the consequence of breaking from the Catholic Church first through England, and then breaking from the abuses of the Kingdom of England at one stage to, under the grace of God, come up with a better idea, or a better ideal, more than an idea, for freedom, for love, for understanding, with a lot of blood in the, mid, in the meantime, as any other revolutions have carried, a lot of blood. So, though they were processes to find peace, they were very painful processes. They were not about finding peace first inside and then finding the community of peace. They were about fighting the oppressor and then finding a place on earth where, where we could find some comfort and start a new nation
to see if we can make it better. Those are completely different processes. You know, one, the popcorns, and the other one, fighting for peace. If you are starting to become peaceful, you're not going to fight anybody. But that puts you in a place which is very vulnerable. Okay? As a person told me in One Nation, uh, said to me, Joshua, if somebody touches you a woman, an elder woman, I'll, I'll sort them out. Uh, I said, you don't have to do that. Don't tell me what I do. You know, you go share peace with people. I will not allow anybody to kill innocent blood like they've killed my parents and my grandparents when the colonizers came. And then she said to me, you would do a, an easier miracle by walking on water than by healing my, my anger. But if you can heal the anger I carry, I'll consider you a holy person. And I said, well, I think the only person that can heal you is God. And, uh, but in the meanwhile, I'll acknowledge that you have the freedom to act the way you consider is best for you. Okay? And uh, so many people would agree that they would, would defend innocent people who are, let's say, ambassadors of peace if somebody would, would damage them. But that's not what we're called to. We're called to just be the lamb. That's what Jesus said. You know, just you people, Israel, don't bring me your offerings. You are the lamb. You are the offering. Offer yourselves to peace. Well, that's easier said than done, particularly, and I don't know about that because I'm not a woman, but I, I would say from the stories of my grandmother, when you're a mother with three kids and you have to be peace in the face of oppressors and aggressors, and then your husband is sort of not willing to fight because he's a peacemaker, and then he's slaughtered in front of you, who is the mother of the children who's going to be without men, with three children in a land that people are abusing you. I, I cannot imagine or fathom the pain of a situation like that. So if we think in terms of Jesus as being crucified, yeah, because he spoke things which were perhaps a little bit outside of the box for the time, times of Rome, where ambassadors of peace today who are saying that they, they exist anywhere in the world that they would ask of every sovereignty king or queen or nation on this planet to give them access to bring peace to bring comfort to the people are going to have to articulate a lot of words out of the box now what I would like to provide us is the possibility that we can actually do that not so much know the Holy Spirit, which we know, yeah, when we're ignited by God, but to be able to get the wisdom, the knowledge of God, to be able to speak. Because many people that I meet on my journey say to me, Joshua, I know God, I know that peace, but I don't have words to speak about. Well, I have to say to us something. If we don't find the wisdom and the words to articulate the Spirit of God, God doesn't have a voice in this world. Teach. Okay? And God's willing to be set free. To speak. To say. To express. I had a friend who said to me, Joshua, I feel jailed in this world. I said, I don't know how could you possibly feel jailed when you are the jailer. <laughs> and she said, what do you mean? And I said, well... Is God omnipresent according to our best philosophical approximation of infinity and infinite being? Is he or she omnipresent really? And she said, yeah. I don't know if she did because she completely convinced us that it is so. Or just because what, it's what she believes she was told that God is. But she said, yeah. I said, well, if God is omnipresent, it must be in you. Because it's everywhere. 
And a friend of her who was a Christian boy said to me, well, but you know, the only door is Jesus. And I said, okay, I acknowledge your belief and I, I'm not going to fight against that. If that's good for you, you should by all means go through that door. You will be blessed. I'm sure you will. I've met many Christians who are. Okay? But you can't ask me to go through that door because God's given me a gift. And I cannot go about accepting your gift and denying God's gift. It can work. The only question I can ask you is, are you a sinner? Are you a sinner? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, well, then I will be foolish if I have to listen to the words of a sinner. How can I allow a sinner to guide me to God? It doesn't equate. So if you have the word of God in your mouth, I like to hear it. Until then, don't advise me about religion. I'd rather call upon the Father. I think Father is wiser, you know, to guide me than any human being to guide me. Okay? And I am sufficiently prepared intellectually to read the many scriptures about God and make my own mind about what God's revealing me and what God wants for us. For me particularly and for us as a community. And then we can have a dialogue about those things. What can we do together to bring peace to the world? Okay, and so how are we going to articulate this? That's a good question. I can't answer that for you. I know how to articulate it for me. Yeah? But if God's, if God's calling you, as Jeremiah prophesied, that many people would be awakened out of the out of the the nations of the world and brought as one nation back to the astonishment of the whole world, Isaiah says too, then this must be a sample of this gathering. You know, God's got to be talking to every one of you if you're willing to listen. And even if it's confusing and hard in the beginning, you don't know how to listen to God or, you know, because it's, it's, it's brand new, nobody's written a manual on how to listen to God, uh, you will have to discern the voice of the Spirit, so to speak. Now, who protects you? Well, in, in the first place, God protects you, yeah? I don't think you should or could rely on the protection of any nation unless those nations were really godly and they were willing to welcome ambassadors of peace as brothers and sisters. Then they will welcome you, okay? And perhaps the body of science of the world could protect you because the body of science of the world it's not a body concerned with religious beliefs or sovereignties. It's concerned with objective truth. Meaning, this person is not bad. It's just inspired by God. And science could vouch for you that your brain, it's a perfect brain which is shifted from one cognitive map of reality to another cognitive map from reality. And that's why the brain of Melchizedek in my own inspiration, was articulated to protect those humans who will be the offspring of the spiritual values that were planted in this work way back in time by the hand of God and, it's, and the people that he sent, that are ready to blossom to have the means to articulate their sovereignty and their sanity to the whole world. Gee. To be able to say, Stop right there. I know what a schizophrenic is, far from who I am. And I can tell you why. Okay? By the way, I know who makes the law. The law is made by the sovereign. And in my world, God's the sovereign. You've laid your jurisdiction. You've laid your sovereignty. And I don't fight for territory because the whole earth is the glory of God. I don't have to fight. I don't need a permanent visa in any country because as long as gravity affects me, my two feet will be on the earth. Now, it's true with concepts, limited concepts as, as we have created as a human species, we can abuse human beings who are peaceful and have articulated their sovereignty. In old days, when two kings or queens have differences and they couldn't settle, they went to war. In the days of Yeshua Jesus, 
Well, he articulated truth. He ended up in, in the cro on the cross. In the days of the Greek philosopher Socrates, he spoke about truth and he also was mistreated and so on. But that is your choice. Will you or would you consider the possibility that it's better to live for a shorter period of time in this round integrity than have a long life of feeling nobody with no identity, completely homeless in the universe and, and perhaps ill and sad and depressed? That's the choice that every human being is faced with. And I am convinced that more and more people all over the world are waking up to the choice of light, of love, of truth. And so to articulate that nation as a peoplehood who is really viable, down to earth, not a, a kind of spirituality where we have really good friends and we go to churches or workshops and that's just you know a day or two in the month, but a, a society which is spiritual, that in ancient Hebrew words, it's called thy kingdom come. That's the translation. Tabohu malbutecha, bring your kingdom. Or in modern days, I will spell it out, paradise landing. I'm not waiting to go to paradise because I just fit the checklist. I'm applying for the job of bringing paradise to earth. God's got the power to say yay or no, but I, I'm applying for that job. You know, if Jesus hasn't come, it's, it's too much, too long to wait. If the Messiah of Israel, the one that the Jewish people are waiting for, doesn't come, too long to wait. If the uh, uh, Hindus are waiting for the, 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 the Messiah, for, you know, the, the last avatar, the Kalgi avatar, well, that's even longer the wait. Who are those people who are embodying the light? Where are they? They ought to be here. Because otherwise comes an avatar and then we go back to a mess. And that ain't the promise. The promise is that we all will raise up and become that new creation. Okay? And I interpret those words of the Quran where it says that Prophet Muhammad was the last prophet, at the, the seal of the prophet, at the end of all prophets. And I, I, I wish I could read Arabic so that I could say it in Arabic, but you know, the best I can do is say, yeah. And that matches with Jeremiah's prophecy when everybody has the law of God inside. That inauguration happened. If a person wants to come close to God, she or he will. When you have people connected directly by God, you don't need prophets anymore. What, what a pro, what, what's the job of a prophet? If, if you are it, you are completely connected with the source. You know, it would be like call, calling the fire brigade when you know everybody's having a good time at the beach and nothing has happened. I mean, I'm calling, you know, unless you bring the prophet to party too. I mean, to, you know, to, <laughs> or you bring the fire brigade and say, oh, we'll just call you not because there is a fire, we would like you to join us at the beach. We're having a great day. Okay? And we have these possibilities open for us today. All, all the books of old say we can aspire to that, should aspire to that, and we will succeed on that if we do it, if we make it be so. And so my question is, how are we going to articulate from different nations, yeah? without passports to see each other regularly, a nation. Well, we have a precedent to that too. Israel was wandering the whole world, the Jewish people, without a piece of land to be on. And the Roman Empire is gone, and many other empires are gone, but that nation is still here, alive with its own distorted or good costumes, you know, in many different situations, but the nation is alive. And they live 2,000 years without land. Regardless of why that happened, it's factual. So that means that as a peoplehood, we can live scattered without a piece of land. We just have to know how to hold the dream together until it materializes all over the world. 
a nation without land. You know, that would be absolutely, I mean, I, I, my parents are Jewish, my mom is Jewish, my grandmother is Jewish. I mean, going back to no land, there are rabbis who are saying, yeah, that would be better than having the Naturei Carta people are marching recently, you know, in New York, protesting against the modern state of Israel, because they say this is not the state of the godly uh, land of Israel being holy and peaceful to all nations. Okay, I'm not criticizing any nation or, or validating any nation, I'm just pointing out facts that I see in the scriptures, not from a religious point of view, from a lawful point of view. If we had to bring some order lawfully, we had to look at these situations as brothers and sisters and say, wait, well, the nation of God ain't gonna be under any sovereignty. They, they don't have bosses on top of them, but God. And you say, well, well, no human is like that. Yes, there are humans like that. In the rainforest, the kings and queens of the world, they, they don't have bosses on them. The body of the law is on them. If they misbehave, well, they're out of kingdoms. You know, and if they behave, well, they, they, they stay there. So, how are we going to articulate that? Again, you need to come up with those answers to me personally. Not to me, but if I have to hear it from somebody, that's what I mean. It's out of your mouth. I cannot say for any of you, you are the sovereign people of God. I can't. I'd be lying to you. Because I don't know how scared or how ready you are to be a sovereign being with nobody to protect you by God. That's something you need to decide for yourself. But I can see, completely say this from my heart and my own consciousness. If you do so, if you decide that, no matter how hard it could be in the beginning for you to find that place of being an integrity, you will do a favor to you, to your family and to the whole world. You will, you will be the person that we're waiting for. And if you are the person that we're waiting for, well, we've got one now in the world. We need so many more. So many more. I made my calculations. If God gave any of us, let's say God gave me the power to go from one place to the other in zero time. Okay? Infinite speed. And then it gave me the power to look into the eyes of a human being. And in one second, the human being will understand the whole lot. Boom! Transform. You are a Melchizedek now. You are the light in the world. You're a priest unto God. Just in one second. Look at me. Boom. You are. You are. If God gave me that power, it will take me more or less 7 billion seconds to visit all of humanity. That's more or less 222 years. Okay? By the time I, I, I visited a third of the population, one third is dead and a new third is born, so that's a never ending process. One Messiah ain't going to do it. Peace cannot be enforced. That's not peace. That's not the peace from God. The peace from God comes by invitation, not by enforcement. Okay? God never invades your soul to make you peaceful. He sets the rules, the laws. This gravity, you jump from that building, you're going to hit the ground. And I, I'm not changing gravity for you unless I think it's the wisest thing to do. I imagine God set the laws for a reason or the Creator, or the process of evolution under the Creator's uh, guidance and plan. I don't mind how we conceptualize this world, if it evolved or came out of nowhere, but how it is, it has laws and boundaries. And those boundaries, for us humans, we have to respect, otherwise we get damaged. Both physically, if we put our hands on fire, or spiritually, if we trespass somebody else's psyche or spirit or mind emotionally we harm each other and that pain is telling us move on you shouldn't be where you are your hand shouldn't be on fire you shouldn't be harming other people or being loud or angry move on and so finding that peace it's prerogative number one your prerogative it's priority to number one your priority and then out of that maybe we'll meet and articulate a nation outside of all nations. A nation who is not a political state, a nation who has no land because the whole world is God's land. And a nation who's not vouching a world government or a process of globalization as understood by the secular reductionist materialism 
that it's ruling the world, but a place where everybody is welcome as family, where anybody wishes to go. And that might be a very difficult thing to even imagine can happen. But I'm gonna tell you something. It ain't gonna happen if we cannot imagine it. Hmm. And the second thing I need to tell ourselves is that somebody has already imagined it pretty well for us and has passed the dream on from generation to generation. It's a transgenerational dream, the dream of peace. And why it has succeeded? Well, I'm sure it has succeeded because, let's say, in modern terms of, as a corporation, it had a core values and a vision and people were committed to those values and that vision. And so it was handed on from generation to generation. And it doesn't matter if you were born, you know, as a, as a Hindu or as a Muslim or as a Buddhist or as a Jewish or as a Christian, the dream was there, it was handed on. Now, I don't think we should give up this dream. What I think we should, we should do is share a vision yeah, I'm talking in terms of corporations, share a vision. And if we really sit down to, to see all these scriptures and words of wisdom of all prophets of all time, the vision is already there, shared. That, that was the object of the scriptures. It was to share the vision. It was to leave a record where we will not lose track of the vision, peace instead of fragmented parcels of power or wisdom or understanding or little parcels of black magic or white magic or this magic or that magic, it was a shared vision where all humans should be under one and only one God of peace, the, the God of the universe, a shared vision, a family like humanity. And so I would definitely invite every one of us to nurture the possibility that you may, if you're not already, become an ambassador or ambassadoress of peace to this world. And that one day, you will need no passport or nationality. Even if you're not allowed 10 meters away from your country, you will rather live like that. And I'm not saying to you, you should do that by tomorrow. I'm just saying to you, just consider that possibility that you're the kind of person who can renounce his or her nationality and become an ambassador of peace to all nations, how would you feel about that? How would your life look like? Where would you find the stamina and the guts to do that? Because if there are not enough people to do that, the other alternative, as I see, it's fragmentation, chaos, and perhaps a central government for the planet to, in the name of security and order, try to sort out everybody by force. I wouldn't like to witness to something like that. I'd rather witness to a bunch of people stepping out of fear and declaring themselves sovereign ambassadors of peace and going about their lives building a humanity which is family-like. Even if that means talking for the rest of your life and being peace in action wherever God sends you in very simple situations like babysitting or cooking for somebody but just being that ambassador of peace. And uh, okay, so I would like to open a round of questions. See if we can make this a little bit more participative instead of me just um, telling you what I have realized in my life. And uh, if you want to read about the Embassy of Peace, I mean, there is an essay that Florian, a person from Germany, and I wrote. And personally, particularly, that um, um, essay for the Embassy of Peace comes from my life experience and his life experience. And my life experience is mainly, you know, to address my life as a person. You know, I, I am peace, first. Second, my immediate community, bloodlines, who are my ancestors. I need to bring that first to my ancestors and articulate it there, yeah? And that would be the Jewish nation, 